Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church of Phoenix. We're so very glad you're here with us to worship and praise together, to learn. If you'll stand with us and sing as people are coming in, look forward to praising together our Lord and Savior. so grateful that you brought us here today. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for this time to worship each other. And God, as we think about all the different experiences that you brought us through, we're just grateful that you are a guiding light. Life is not easy. and We have our ups and downs. Thank you for the consistency that you represent for us. Thank you for the word that you've given us that we can learn and glean how to navigate this life together through you. We pray these things in your son's most holy and precious name. to share some scripture from the book of Luke, chapter 10. Now it happened, as they went, they entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. 
and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her.
Jesus is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church of Phoenix on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, if you're new here to the church, if this is the first time you've ever been here, we do have some connection cards, and we invite you to fill those out and place those in the offering box as you are um, exiting the building this morning. And we do have, a, a, this is a big Sunday, I'll get to that in just a second, but we do have a couple events that we want to make sure all of you are aware of. We do have our monthly senior luncheon, which will be happening this Wednesday at the church, noon, and for those of you who plan on attending, make sure that you sign up. The sign-up sheet is in the foyer, so sign up for that on your way out. And then also, we don't have the sign-up sheet yet, but we've been promoting a Seder meal on Thursday before Easter. And just to make sure everyone's clear on what we're doing, the Seder meal is a Jewish meal where they did the Passover. And the wonderful thing is, for those of you who understand what was taking place, is Christ actually fulfilled different parts of the Seder meal. And so what we're going to be doing is focusing on Christ is the fulfillment of prophecies. And Charlie is going to be um, leading us through that. We'll have a sign-up sheet. So if you want to learn more about your faith and how Jesus is the fulfillment of very many prophecies and the meal itself, um, make sure you plan on joining us. I'm not sure how many people we're going to have, but it'll be a great time Thursday night. The date is in your bulletin, but that will be right before Easter Sunday. And also, we are wrapping up our... February and March Sunday School classes, and we have two new ones starting in May, or for April and May, and the two new topics and teachers will be Brian Clark, he is going to be teaching, and his topic is the 10 dumbest things that Christians do. <laughs> the list was 65, but he had to pare it down to 10, so if you want to know what the top 10 are, go to his class, and John Catermole is teaching Divine Dialogues out of the book of John. So we have great Sunday school classes here at our church. I encourage all of you, you know, pick one. We, we rotate every two months. But both of those are sound like great topics. We have a great time of discussing, sharing with each other. So those are the next two. 
and uh, Mike and uh, Joel will be finishing up their classes, respective classes, next Sunday. And then also, last main announcement for today is lunch. We want you to stick around for lunch right after church. Everyone is invited to stay. And the reason for that is because Pastor Brent and Katie Beefus are with us today, and they are candidating for the role of our pastor of discipleship. And so I want you at this time to come join me up on stage. I'm going to for them. Brent is going to be preaching for us this morning. And we did have, during Sunday school, we had a combined Sunday school class, and we had kind of an interview to get to know Pastor Brent and Katie. For those of you who were not here, if you would like to watch that, it is going to be on Facebook. We live on Facebook. Go to our Facebook page. You could watch that. It's a great way to get to know them better. Um, they're making a big decision. We're making a big decision, seeing where God might lead us. So uh, we're thrilled that they are here. It's a quick 48 hours that they're but great opportunity to get to know them and really see where God is leading them and us. So I want to put Mr. Brent and Katie as they, as they share with us today. Lord, I'm, I'm grateful for um, the privilege of serving you. It is something that all of us as believers should realize, that we have this opportunity to serve you in, in the unique way that you've gifted us and to make the decision to enter into um, a lifetime of serving you is a, a huge commitment, and Brent, Brent is a commitment. And so for, that, for us today... Um, we're excited about what this opportunity means for us as a church to um, go deeper and wider in our, our reach and our relationships and our impact for you. And so um, I just pray that you give them the wisdom and the insight that they need to know decisions they need to make and for our board as we uh, meet to discuss um, these next steps. But Lord, for today, we're excited to hear what you have put on Pastor Brent's heart to share with us from your words. So we pray your blessing upon him and us as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, and good morning. I enjoyed my time with uh, you guys in Sunday school, and uh, as a part of what we did in the Sunday school, I, I did a couple of introduction uh, things about who I am, and, and I figured that since not everyone was probably at Sunday school, I could probably tell you uh, a little bit about myself in, in three different pictures, or I guess three different things. So I, I brought a, a little bit of me, uh, most of you guys in Sunday school know what this plant is. Do you guys know what this is? This is a coffee plant. Uh, something about me is that I absolutely love coffee um, to the effect where I do almost everything with coffee. I like growing things, and I found with a friend in Minnesota that we can literally grow coffee from seed. And this, this wasn't one that we actually grew from seed. Um, I'm a little bit into coffee. This is Juan, Juan Lopez. It's my coffee plant. It's grown a little bit over the years. I've had it for at least five years now. That's kind of what it looks like uh, just a little bit ago. It's uh, in our indoor greenhouse because you can't grow coffee outside in Minnesota in the middle of winter. And my wife has been kind to me to let me grow a bunch of different plants. And I was super excited that you see those red things? They're coffee cherries. I literally got flowering coffee and then cherries from my own plant which is just kind of a neat thing. I don't actually do anything with the beans. I'll try to replant it, but I enjoy growing things. That's one thing about me. The other thing I uh, uh, enjoy doing is, um, you, you know what the, di the little basket is over there? It's disc golf. I like disc golfing, and it gets cold in Minnesota. We still went disc golfing, and I am not overdressed at that time. It was... I, I took a snapshot. It, was, it felt like negative 24 that day. It's cold, and it's fun still to play. It play it, the discs fly a little differently. It's also odd because if you actually have a really good throw and it's in the middle of the fairway, it's sometimes the hardest thing to find because we have a foot of snow, and we have no idea where the disc goes. But I enjoy disc golfing. I would love to disc golf in warmer weather, though, because this is not always the funnest thing to do. Uh, and then the third thing about me is uh, my wife and I, we got married last September, so we've been married for six months. Um, we, when we got married, um, both had dogs. The, the dog on your right is Katie's dog, Benson, and uh, the dog on the left is my dog, um, Echo. And uh, one of the things that I enjoyed is that she's a, a dog person, and I was very happy that she enjoys other dogs, and that, as you can tell, Echo and Benson really do, do get along um, and they're our companion animals, so it was kind of cool to see that we 
got married, and then our, our dogs do really get along. So those are a couple of quick things about me. Um, I, I do want to give you some insight into, uh, I guess, how I see ministry and, and how I would love to do ministry. Um, I, I do want to share this from Scripture. Uh, but as I, as I do share this from Scripture, I guess I would like you to understand how I view Scripture and, and how I will read it. Uh, because one of the things that I think we all should recognize is that we all come to the Bible with some preconceived ideas or notions or, or inclinations. Sometimes these things are intentional and it's a good thing. Other times it's not. And we tend to do things and make the, the Bible say what we want to say. And so I'd like to approach this in a way where I want to let you know how I approach Scripture so you can understand my, my lens, my worldview, or how I handle it. And if anything, encourage me to be more consistent with it. But, but my desire and the lens that I approach Scripture is I, I do want to ask this question. And the question that I want to ask is, what is God saying? Because God is ultimately the one who is authoring and communicating but what is God saying through this author? Because the person who is writing a letter is a person who has personality, he has tendencies, he writes a certain way, and he is describing and talking to a people group. So what would God be saying through this author to this audience? And this audience has problems. They have history. They have things that engage in their life, and usually the author is writing about a purpose and a reason. So what is God saying through this author to this audience? And then when I understand that, how does that truth, that principle, what I've learned about what God wants from me and others, how does that intersect and engage in my life? So that's the question I like to ask when I look at Scripture. And then as I read it, I do it through a historical, grammatical, contextual way of doing it. And I know those are some big words, but... Historically, I want to read the Bible and understanding there is a history, right? There is a city, a people group, a problem sometimes. There is stuff that you can understand when, when we're reading that helps us understand what God is communicating. It's also grammatical. Sometimes um, this is the boring side of things. I wasn't a huge grammar person in high school. But there are direct objects, there are prepositions, purpose statements, and those things, when you start looking at the comparisons and contrast, they help you understand what might be important in that particular section. So grammar is important. Other times, you're reading a book and it's poetic. You're going to read a poetry book different than an epistle because it's more didactic and teaching. So you approach it grammatically and then contextual. Uh, one of the things that I don't like when people do is if you take one verse and read that verse and then you go snipe a different verse from a different location and you kind of bring a theology together of one-liners, that's not very good context. I would say that the verses right before and right after what this section says tells you a lot about what's going to be important, just like if you read that chapter or that book and sometimes that author, before you start running and going all these other locations. So that's the lens I read and do scripture. It's the framework that I, I, I bring. And I, I want to ask this question, what would God be saying to these, to, from this author to this audience? And then how does that impact our life? Now, today, as we talk about ministry or how ministry would be done or how God works in this world today, have you ever asked the question, what's God's plan A? Have you ever wondered, what would God's plan A be to do work in our world today? What would be on the top of his list? What, what does he say? This is where we begin. What, what's the primary method? How will he do this work? Who is involved in doing this work? What's his plan A? Now, one of the things I would say is when God talks to us, he is communicating through his scripture and that we can learn a lot through there. But his plan A is one of those things we, we engage with. There, there's, a, there's a really cool skit by the skit guys. Um, it's called the God's Chisel skit. I don't know if you are familiar with that skit at all. In this skit, there's this character named Tommy. And at the beginning, he's kind of reading Ephesians chapter 2, talking about how he is a workmanship, a masterpiece. And he prays 
to God to say, you know, I want to be more like this masterpiece or this workmanship. I don't feel like it very much right now. Can you come and do this? And remarkably, God shows up and starts to do that. He takes this hammer and a chisel, and he starts knocking things out of Tommy's life that should not be there, that don't belong, so that he could look more like Jesus. And in the skit, you find that Tommy kind of says, this is enough, that's painful, it's not, not, I don't like this, this is uncomfortable. But sometimes I wonder if that's our image of what we think God's going to do with us. He's going to appear and, and chisel things out of our lives that don't belong so that we look like Jesus. And it's, I mean, it's kind of a comical thing of thinking that this hammer and chisel are just floating around taking things out of us. But I wonder if that's a thought that we have. And certainly God will interact with our lives and he will chip away those things. But I would, I would suggest, just maybe, that God would be using his word and other people in the body of Christ to actually do this work in us and through us to impact the world around us. To look at this, I, I want to go to the book of Ephesians. So uh, please join with me in the book of Ephesians. As you do, um, I love this book. Uh, this is one of my favorite books. I was able to preach through this a while back. Um, this book is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, it, it is a circuit letter, which means it went around to different churches, uh, but it was mainly a, a letter towards the city in Ephesus. It's in Asia Minor, mod modern-day Turkey. Uh, the pastor there is Timothy, which was a young guy. In the first half of this book, if you read through Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, it's a lot of heady stuff. It's a lot of knowledge. Um, there's words like predestination and election. A lot of people like to debate and talk about that. But you read in Ephesians 1 that the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance for what is to come. We are secure in Christ. Language like that is reassuring and encouraging. Chapter 2, he moves into this, the, the instruction that salvation is by grace through faith. We don't earn this. We don't get this. We have a relationship with God because he loves us. And then he even moves into this part about how we now not only have peace with God, we have peace with people. And for them, he was talking about two people groups that hated each other. And he says, you have a peace that you should enjoy that's been given to you by Christ. And then he moves into chapter 3 to talk about how he has been given this ministry to, to be interacting and talking to the Gentiles of what he has for them. But then in chapter 4, we see him kind of pivot. Because as he was talking about knowledge and in some sense theology, he, he turns and says this knowledge should provoke you, should lead you, should encourage you, prompts you into practice. It's a kind of him belting out that knowledge leads into practice. And we're going to be joining in chapter 4 because when you look at 4, he talks about this unity of believers at the beginning, he talks about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And then he says that Christ has come and he has preached to this earth, to the lost, and now he has ascended into heaven and he's giving us good gifts. And so we're now in Ephesians chapter 11, or chapter 4, excuse me, verses 11 through 16. I'm going to read through this. It says, and he, speaking of Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. To give you some cliff notes, and if you're going to tune me out here, I'm going to give you a couple of things. Uh, Christ, as you read through this section, we find Christ is key. 
He is the one that's giving us these good gifts. He is actually the corporate goal, not just an individual one. He is the goal. He is that nutrition that helps us grow into that, and he is the head. That's kind of what Paul communicates. Christ is essential in this work. But then you find that the way this is lived out, the way that this is practiced, expected to be done, is through community. The gifts that we have are supposed to be used for others, not just for yourself. And the language, if you read through it again, you're going to find it's that we all reach, that we are doing this, that the whole body grows. There is no measurement of an individual. It's a measurement of the, the, the body of Christ, the people that are there together growing. And he, and he emphasizes this is done through love. Going back to verse 11, it says... He, Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip, for the, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Jesus has given gifts. He has equipped us. And he talks about being equipped. These gifts and these people are equipped to do two things. He says they're done for the work of ministry and for building up the body of Christ. He gives us two purpose statements there. They're for works of service and so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, I just want to kind of do a little quick note. He doesn't tell you that you get to lay a beat down on the person with errant theology. Nor is he actually saying you get to take that gift that was given to you and you get to hold on to it and profit by it. I know sometimes that's a little disappointing and it would be a lot easier that way, wouldn't it? Because working with others is hard and my goodness, they're wrong. But God does not delight in Christians sending seething blog posts at each other. He doesn't take pleasure in that. God's given us good gifts to build others up. And that building others up is into the image of Christ. If you continue into verse 13, he says that we're doing these things until, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He says we're working along this line. We're walking this path. We're growing together so that we can reach maturity And it's interesting that when he talks about maturity here, he is talking about the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. When you get into this conversation about unity, it's it's a sticky conversation because we come with many thoughts of what unity should be or is. I don't think unity here is this one mind of doctrine. I would say it's one mind of faith. And I know that depends on how I'm describing, defining things, but I think I could define one mind of doctrine. When, when sometimes we think of unity and it's like, oh, hey, one mind of doctrine, that means I'm going to take a carbon copy of myself and then transfer it to you. That's one mind of doctrine. You know exactly what I know and you believe the same thing that I think. If you want a different illustration, it's basically more technology. Um, I will wipe your hard drive Download the latest and greatest theology thinking and upload that. And so now you are now with the latest and greatest operating system, which is something that I don't think God wants us to specifically be doing because you're not necessarily making Christians. You're making, in that sense, I would be making Brentians, which I don't think God delights in. And when you walk into this idea of one mind of faith, that's tough. Because that's, that's going to say we're going to have to have a commitment around something a little different than you thinking exactly like me. It's around the commitment to the gospel, a focus on what Jesus has done for us and who he has made us, and even what he has promised for us and where we're heading. And even if you can look at me and you probably be thinking, man, your processor is slow, it's corrupt, you're full of hobby horses, it's cluttered in there we find that our unity in Christ is more important than for me to make you exactly like me because we're pursuing who Christ is. 
And I'm not saying that doesn't mean we don't grow in knowledge. There is an element. We do grow in knowledge. We do grow in maturity there. But we're holding fast to this identity, the core of who we are, and it's on Christ. And we want to learn to become more like him in our life. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. There are times where it's good to be a, a child or have a childlike faith. In fact, Jesus welcomes the children, and, and he says those are good things, but not here. Paul kind of points out that he does not want to see big babies in church. Now, when we talk about children, this is kind of the illustration he's pulling out. He talks about children or babies. When you think of it, they're, they're defenseless. Um, sometimes they're smelly. They're incapable of providing for themselves. And their language of communication is crying. And if you don't get what they want at that particular moment, what happens is that the crying gets louder. And Paul doesn't want them to have this infancy in their faith. He wants them to grow past this infancy into a maturity. In this image, it's so that they're protected or they're safe from the winds of bad teaching, from cunning or trendy or devious teaching that attempts to, to make you more aligned with that particular person or teaching or movement. Paul says you don't want to walk down that path or move down that direction. You should always aim to become more like Christ. Hold fast to that foundation that it's God through Christ in you. Rather, he wants us to speak the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working pop properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The goal he mentions is that the church should grow. I think if we ask ourselves, what are the motivations for us to come to a church, to be here, what would we respond with? I think sometimes the response that I would put in my mind is, well, I want to be a better person, right? I want to be better. It's interesting that when Paul talks about the reason people gather at church isn't for an individual to say, I want to grow. It's for the body to be growing together. His eyesight isn't usually on the consumer. It's on, on the community. He, he wants you to help others grow, to be in the business of looking at others and say, how do I use my gift? How do I leverage my relationship so I can encourage you to take those next steps? Because if I'm helping you do that, you also have that same eyesight for me so that we both are growing together into the image of Christ. In a way, for me, I, I love the illustration of thinking we're arriving at a construction zone. We're, we're, we're arriving at a construction zone of someone's life. And if you think about arriving at someone's construction zone, what's there? When you engage with them, have they laid a foundation? What's, what's going on with their home? Are, is their framework up? Do they have plumbing? Do, do they have a leaky roof? Where are they in that process of, of growing and becoming more like Christ? And the challenge is that you're, you're challenged to help them take their next step, not your next step their next step, and it's for their benefit. I know that it would be really, really fun to get to their place and say, you know what you need? You need a pool, because everyone enjoys pools. Let's build a pool, and you realize that, or you fail to realize, they have no plumbing. And they're just trying to figure out how that works in their life, and you're talking about a pool. That's such a different world. We're challenged to walk into their lives and say, what's here? How do I help them take that next step, even if it's a small step? By joyfully using your spiritual gift. 
And in so doing, we become more like Christ. Notice that when you, you see this here, there's two words of in love. It starts at the beginning of verse 15 and at the end of 16. He says, speaking the truth in love and building itself in love. The way that we interact has to have that element, has to be done in love. And, and when you talk about the definition of love, it, it's not the way the world is inclined to speak of love, nor really is it even your inclination of love. It has to be the definition of love that God defines. And when you look at where is it that God defines love, I would say turn to 1 Corinthians 13 and read through that chapter because it speaks of the definition that love is for God. If you go to even 1 Corinthians, you, you find in chapter 12 this imagery of Paul talking about this body and how there is a, a body that we are a part of, and there's so many different parts of this body with different gifts and passions and abilities, and they're all different yet necessary, unique, and no one can look at it and say, you do not belong or you're not worthy enough. We all matter. And he says, how in the world will all, all these people who are so different get along? At the end of chapter 12, he start, ends with this statement, by saying, I will show you a still more excellent way. He talks about the body and all these differences, and he says, I'm going to show you how this works together. And he launches into 1 Corinthians 13. And when you read 1 Corinthians 13, it's about love. The first three verses of the chapter, you, you read that he says, if I have all the knowledge of the world, if I have all the power in the world, if I have all the wealth in the world, it would mean absolutely nothing if I did not also have love with this. Love was that essential to him. And then he goes into this definition of love that is incredibly deep. If you want to know how do you engage with others, how do you live with others to help them grow, I would challenge you, spend some time in 1 Corinthians. Read through this definition of love. And if you get at the end of it saying, how in the world does this live? Who's done this? I would say, go, go to the life of Christ. Walk through the Gospels. Look at the stories that he interacts with, who he interacts with, how he responds. How did he talk to the outcast of the society? To those that no one would touch? How did he even talk to his disciples? I mean, there are times when I read through those stories and I'm going, my goodness, they can't get it, they don't get it, and they're so frustrating. They ask so many silly questions, but look how he responds to them. Notice the nature of how he cares. Look how he talks to the religious leaders. It's a very different tune, but in a way, it would be still loving to confront them and demonstrate what that means for us. Even the, the scripture verse that we were reading this morning, Luke, it reminds me of the story of Mary and Martha. Notice the way he interacts with those two women very differently. In the story about Lazarus, when Lazarus dies, you find Jesus talking so differently to Mary and, so, and very differently to Martha because of who they were. He knew how to address their hearts. Spend some time just learning what does it mean for Christ to do that. He loved and he loved in the definition that we should. Because that's the way we want to arrive at someone else's construction zone. Asking, how do I help you take your next step to become more like Christ? Because when you, when you know that you have this element of love, love helps us see others the way that God sees them and loves them. Love also helps us swallow how right we may be, how good we have been, how inadequate we may feel, and sometimes it just helps us swallow this feeling of how awkward we may be, because it's not about us. It's about what God has done for us, which includes them. God's love directs us to value because we've been loved and valued. And it's by the God of the universe, no less. 
we love others because of the love we have received. So today, we, we started by asking about this question of, well, how is ministry done? How does God work in our world today? Uh, what is God's plan A? I would say he uses the church. He uses us, the members of the body of Christ. He's given us gifts so that we can do so. We are expected participants in the way that God interacts with the world around us, which... Honestly, this is equally as exciting and thrilling as terrifying and daunting because we think of, well, God's using us. That's fantastic. That's cool. I get to join on it. But then I also think sometimes when I look at other Christians in my own life and I go, wait, he's using us? Oh, boy, that's something that's not good because there's times we know who we are deep down. We feel like a mess. I mean, we have problems. Looking at my construction zone, I, I feel like something's living in the attic that shouldn't belong there. There's asbestos in the walls, and please don't go to the bathroom. <laughs> How am I supposed to help others build or grow to be more like Christ? The challenge that I guess I would have, and I think this is something we're always supposed to do, is intimidating, but a lot of this is maybe me just preaching to myself because it, it's this idea that we need to embrace the chaos of relationships in the body of Christ, which sometimes is, is intimidating because you, you may tell me you don't know my story, you don't know what it's like, I, you don't know what has happened in my past. There's been relationships even inside of the church where I feel like I've been backstabbed, that I've been misunderstood, that they have really treated me poorly. I don't like that feeling. I don't want to go back there. I don't like getting that close. I understand that completely. In fact, I, I think my story comes along that line. But when I look at my life and how I've interacted even with this thought, the, the times where I've try to push away and keep myself protected and, and try to stay at a distance are the moments where I, I notice that everything is passing me by and I am no longer really engaging in how God is working today. And if I'm talking with the church, as I say, we should embrace the chaos of relationships in the body of Christ, what I think that this might translate to is that I think when you look at your programs, leverage those times to get into deeper relationships with the believers in the community around you. Leverage those times. If you, you guys had your bean bag battle, something else be challenge, those are moments where you can actually engage with people in a very non-threatening way to dive into a deeper relationship, to be able to say, hey, let's go have some coffee. Let's, let's go engage into a deeper walk with each other. Those are moments you have. They're opportunities because if you start forgetting that that's a thing you can do with these programs, sometimes I feel like we're wandering into territory where we're just doing the thing because we did the thing last year and we're going to keep doing this thing the years that go down. We forget that these are moments where we can interact and encourage each other and help each other grow more like Christ. And yes, when you do get into relationships, it gets extraordinarily messy. But, I mean, think about it. Who has left that deepest impact in your life? In your walk with God? What, what did they say to leave that impact? What Really, what did they do? I, I remember... Actually, I remember a lot of the things that this person who I'm thinking of has said to me because I was writing them down. But a lot of it I do remember is I remember the way he made me feel, how he spent time with me as a young pastor just to invest and show that he cared, whether it was just sharing meals or at other moments talking to me about what he valued which were the moments where I wanted to spend time and pay attention because I knew he valued me and cared for me. But those moments came when I was having time spent with him. 
God has given you a gift. And he's given you this gift to be able to serve your neighbor, to serve your brother and sister in Christ. And it's so that we can look more like Christ together. And it's supposed to be done as a community rather than apart from each other. I mean, think about it. What would that look like? What would it look like if we found a community of believers that loved each other so much that they wouldn't let a superficial relationship exist, that they did want to dive into deeper relationships, that they shared, that they showed that they cared, that we arrived at other people's construction zone and said, I want to help you build whatever is next. What would that look like? What would the neighborhood even think about what that is? That they would notice how Christians are talking to each other. They're not fighting. They're actually engaging and encouraging. For these last three years, I've spent time in a secular workforce. Here's a FedEx illustration for you. <laughs> they had more things to say about what they didn't like about Christians than what they had to say about who Christ is. And it's because of how we maybe interact with each other. I invite you to invest your gift into others in the body of Christ, which is the question of whose construction zone are you passing by this week? How can you encourage them to take that next step, whatever that may be? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We talk about how you work and how you move in this world today, and we're so thankful that you talk to us, that you have communicated truth to our lives, so that we can read what you have to say, um, even through this author, to an audience that is different than us, but have truths and principles and challenges and problems that are very similar to the way that we, we feel that we go through life. I pray that as we read your word, as we engage with it as a community, that we would not just leave here thinking that was really cool, that was great, that we would, I just pray that we would move to live this out, that we would embrace, in some sense, how to engage with each other into a deeper relationship so we are encouraging, so that we help each other grow, so that we love each other as you have loved us. I just pray that you would help us um, take steps in that direction. Give us patience when we feel like the other person needs to take bigger steps Help us to see them in the way that you see them. You love them. And you love us. Pray that we would be able to rest in that. That we'd be encouraged by that. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Will you stand with us and we'll close in the song? darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came run there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a great
We're going to dismiss you to lunch now. I'm going to pray for our meal and uh, before we get dismissed and for our time together. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for your the time together. Thank you for the time of praise and worship. And that we will leave here being challenged by the words that you laid on Brent's heart. To think of not of ourselves and the gifts that you've given us for our own glory or for our, um, even our own safety. But that we will use those to be challenged to be your handiwork and your workmanship in our community. And that our community is wherever you've put us in our life. So this week we think about our workplace and our school and our neighbors and this church and the community. And we're just grateful that you've equipped us and that you've challenged us and that you call us to act and to um, worship you in doing so. And that we'll do it speaking in truth and love. As our time together, we just ask that you bless the food, give us uh, nourishment through it. Our time be encouraging as we continue to get to know Brent and Katie and a little bit more about each other. In your son's most holy and precious name, amen. You are dismissed to lunch. Thank you.